Hi, my name is Matt, and this is a 1999 Chevy Blazer with a 4.3 liter V6 that is owned by my friend, and he has a misfire problem, and we're going to try to fix it, but I am not going to do the thing like most home mechanics like myself do, where you change the plug wires and then change the spark plugs, and that doesn't do it, so you change the distributor cap, and then you go down the line replacing thing after thing until you finally get it. What I'm going to do is try using a very strategic methodological approach to determine exactly what is wrong with this car and we're only going to fix what needs to be fixed. So that should save us time and money especially and hopefully this will help you if you have a misfire problem or even a no start condition this will also apply and not necessarily if you have a Vortec engine. But that's what we're going to do today so we'll see how this works. Uh, the car is this way. So when approaching the misfire on any one cylinder or multiple cylinders or even a no start condition, your possible causes are pretty much the same. And it's basically a matter of how to intelligently approach the causes from the simplest to the least simplest and also considering the most likely versus the least likely. So your possibilities here are fuel problem, compression problem, spark problem, a timing problem. Timing problem probably not with one cylinder misfiring. So what we're going to do is try to put these in order of the most likely to cause this problem first and then we'll move on probably fuel last on this particular vehicle because these fuel systems are a little kinky on this and I'll explain that in a little bit. So that's our plan of attack here. So the first thing we want to do is get as much data as possible. So I've hooked up to my AutoTap scan tool. This is a great, great little scan tool if you're a home mechanic. You don't need a scan tool like this though. You can go up to your AutoZone or use your little Actron code scanner. The car was showing just one code, a P0305, which is going to be a misfire number five. The check engine light was flashing as is normal with a misfire. So clearly misfire cylinder number five. We can see right here the misfire count after just a few seconds running the car. So it's misfiring every time. Um, also my um, cylinder number five is on bank one. I can tell by my fuel adjustment on bank one, which maybe we'll cover later. Most people aren't going to look at that. You don't need this information. But there's other things on here that are telling me uh, where the problem is located at. Um, things like timing is shown on here. Um, maybe not on the screen, but I know the timing is certainly okay and some other things. So this helps to approach a really good methodological system for processing the information and making some good decisions on where we're going to go next. And right now that's going to be Spark. So while I hook up this inline Spark tester real quick here, there's other ways of testing Spark. You can pull the plug and put it next to a ground or something like that. Not the safest way to do it as if you don't want to get shocked and you also don't want to damage any delicate electrical components if you ground out to the wrong place but this is a, like a two dollar spark tester right here and this is going to basically light up if I have spark there so I'm going to go ahead and test that out but while I'm doing that one other thing that uh, the customer here mentioned is that the car has had this misfire problem for a while he said it actually was working fine on the way up here until he pulled into my driveway and then it acted up again which is fortunate I guess um, make it easier for us to find it but uh, keep in mind we may be dealing with an intermittent here and those are always tricky so let's go ahead and fire this thing up and see if we've got some spark here All right, we saw that there was indeed spark there, so spark is always a really good place to start on most cars because it's usually the easiest and quickest to diagnose. We always want to start with the easiest and quickest stuff first. Um, by the way, I'm through the wheel well on this car. It's the easiest way to get to the number five spark plug on this particular model. So the next thing we want to do is, I, I really don't think compression is an issue here because when I turned over the car it sounded like the compression was just fine. Usually you can hear if there's bad compression. But because we're already here at the number five cylinder and these plugs are pretty easy to get at, I'm going to go ahead and do compression on number five next and rule that out. 
All right, before doing the compression test, we want to disconnect the coil and we also want to disable the fuel. We don't want the car to start during the compression test and we also don't want to wash down the cylinders with fuel because obviously without a spark plug in there we're going to not fire that fuel which is actually happening anyway but I don't want to be the cause of that problem so on this car the easiest way to do it is back here there's a plug for the fuel injectors over the plenum and that will disable the fuel system. You can also pull the fuse in the fuse box for either the fuel pump or the fuel injectors. But now we've got no spark, no fuel. We're ready to do this compression test. The other thing is to fully charge the battery. Um, the battery on this car is actually very weak, so I'm probably going to get a, a kind of weaker numbers on my compression test than I would otherwise, but I'm so positive compression isn't the issue. I'm just going to go on anyway. But normally you want to fully charge the battery so that you can get a good solid compression read. So let's go ahead and do this. Well, sorry about that, my compression gauge jumped on me, but uh, we've got about 140 or so, and I think that's plenty of compression on a car with, uh, I think this one has about 178,000 miles on it, that's plenty of compression there. Um, I, I don't even want to look up the spec on that, but what I am going to do is just get a relative compression over to number one and see if I get a similar result. And if I do, then I'm going to be totally satisfied that we've ruled out compression as the problem here. All right, so now I'm hooked up to number one. And let's go ahead. By the way, notice as I'm starting this, uh, running the starter, um, you can hear that it has a very nice even flow to the starting. You don't hear a lot of dips and waves, uh, indicating that the compression on this engine is pretty good. So really not worried about compression, but let's do this anyway. All right, and that read just about the same, so I'm pretty satisfied that compression is not an issue here. This is not a compression issue. We're going to have to move on to fuel next. But before we do that, the fuel systems on these cars are a little bit kinky. Um, these have the spider injection system, so unlike most injected cars, these injectors are actually located under the plenum, so it's a little bit trickier to get at. So actually what I think I'm going to do is revisit the spark just to make sure that that is not the problem, since that's a very realistic possibility, especially with an intermittent. So that's probably a good first step before we move on to the fuel, which is trickier. The spark test, it does appear that we can rule spark out as the problem for our misfire, but I just want to be really safe, especially since fuel is next and the fuel systems on these Vortec engines are a little bit kinky. I just want to really verify that it is indeed not a problem with the spark system. So um, one of the things with ignition systems is the wires often run alongside of manifolds and things. So I do want to pull this wire and check very carefully that there's no burned insulation. This is just a piece of tape here. Um, but I don't see any evidence of the insulation being frayed or worn or anything like that. So the other thing I want to do is maybe there's an intermittent open in this system. So I'm going to go ahead and connect up a voltmeter to continuity. And when you do this, you're going to want to make sure that you set to the highest ohm setting. Um, there is a fixed specification for the number of ohms per foot in spark plug wires, so if you set it to the lowest setting, you're not going to get continuity and you'll think that you found your problem. So set it to the highest setting, and there's continuity there. And I'm just going to try to pull and tug a little bit on this wire, see if I can create an open, and I cannot. So I am very satisfied, especially since all the connections snapped real tight and satisfying. This is definitely not a spark problem. This is going to be a fuel problem, and now we'll have to go in and take off that plenum and attack the spider injection system. Yes! Greetings. So I know that I was going to go after fuel next, but there's um, some reason to go after timing right now. And there's two reasons for this. The first one is um, this video is supposed to be helping you guys to diagnose your misfire on a car like this with the uh, Vortec engines. So if you guys had a timing problem and I just skipped over it, 
then it wouldn't be very helpful, would it? So I'm going to do it for that reason. But there's also another rational reason too. And that is whenever you take a methodological approach to troubleshooting, you obviously always want to do the fastest, easiest, cheapest tests first that are also the most likely to find your problem and then you move your less likely and especially your most time consuming or expensive tests as the last opportunities and this is kind of an interesting situation because the timing is almost an infinitesimally minimal possibility for this car however on these particular models, looking at the timing is incredibly easy. And I've already got the number one spark plug out, which is one of the things I'll need to do to do this test. So because it's so quick and easy, it just makes sense to go ahead and do this very fast test, 100% eliminate timing from the equation, but also it'll give you a chance to look at your own vehicle and see if you can assess timing as a possible problem for your misfire. So we're going to go ahead and do the timing first, and then we'll get to the fuel problem, which is where I guarantee we will find the issue with this vehicle. So let's go ahead and get that started. So your first step is to remove the spark plug from number one cylinder. Then you'll have to remove the fan to get access to your crankshaft, which is down here under the water pump. You'll need a long handled ratchet because this is going to be a little hard to turn over with all the spark plugs in place and a 5-8 socket and fit it onto the crankshaft bolt and we're going to want to, boy, that's kind of hard to find. There it is. And we're going to want to rotate this crankshaft clockwise to get it to top dead center on the compression stroke of cylinder number one. So we'll show you how to do that. Oh, and real quick, I, I know that a lot of you guys, if you try this, one of your first responses is going to be, how in the world did you get the fan off of that truck? And if there was ever a time when the right tool makes all the difference in the world, this fan removal set is the trick. So what we want to do is I want to get my ratchet on again to that crankshaft. There we go. And this is going to be way easier with two people, but I simultaneously want to get my finger over the spark plug hole on number one, of course, where I remove the spark plug. And while doing that, I want to turn the crankshaft, and it's going to be a little hard to do, until I feel air pushing my finger away. And hopefully I'm already about there because this is going to take a while. There it is. Okay, so I feel air pushing my finger away. All right, so here's what I wanted to do to make life easier here. You're probably familiar with the trick of putting a screwdriver or something. I always put something flexible um, instead of a screwdriver, but you put it into the spark plug hole, see where the highest point of rotation with the piston is, and that's all good and everything. That is not going to be easy to do on this engine, but this engine does have, if you look here on the harmonic balancer, this little groove here. And if you look, I made a white paint mark on this notch that is in the timing cover. And you got to be a little careful here because for some reason on these harmonic balancers, on these vortex, there's actually two grooves. This is not the correct one. I actually painted the other one white, but I just wanted to bring this up to you. Um, we'll pass by, as we rotate the engine, this first groove until we get to the second groove in the balancer. That will be top dead center for cylinder number one, and that will let us go ahead and check this timing. So make sure that you have the correct groove. If you're not sure, go ahead and put something into the spark plug hole and verify that you are actually at top dead center. And also, of course, make sure you are on the compression stroke. So let me go ahead and do that, and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, here you can see my paint marks lining up for the second groove in the harmonic balancer. The first one is, uh, oh, probably somewhere around, I guess, 4 o'clock or somewhere around that position, so you know that you've got it right. But this is the correct position here for top dead center cylinder number one. So that only took me 30 seconds to do. So now all I got to do is pull off the distributor cap and we'll see if our timing is correct.